Hello everybody. I am so happy that you chose once again to join us as we study our, um, do our Bible study. Uh, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come now to study your word, asking as always that even though the, the subject is familiar, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds afresh to speak to us individually and collectively what you would have for us to know. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are continuing on article number 11, The Perseverance of Saints. And our author writes, We believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end that their persevering attachment to Christ is the grand mark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be uh, John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32 and the truth will set you free. And one such freedom that we've been discussing is the freedom from discouragement and frustration, which is found in Romans the 8th chapter verses 18 through 28. And we have made our way down to verse 28, and it reads, have, in, just in case you've missed any of our, our previous lessons, you can always go back on our YouTube channel to uh, catch up. So, But right now, we're on verse 28, and it reads, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. And so this verse caused us to pause or to slow down and take what I call the scenic route. By definition, the scenic route is a way that is not the fastest way, but it, it has a beautiful scenery that would otherwise be missed if we stayed on the main road. And so we chose to take this route to see the beauty of the Father, of the love that the Father has for all of us, even those that choose not to love him. Even though he has promised to work all things out for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, that does not mean that he does not love everybody because he does. And so we are pausing to take a look at that love. If you can imagine in your mind's eye that you're driving along a road and, and, and the road is called spiritual freedom and you come to a crossroad that offers you two choices. One choice is to remain on the road called spiritual freedom. And the second choice is to exit the main road to take a scenic route called the love of the Father, with the promise that at the end of the route, it will return you to the main road. Think of it like uh, pulling off the highway at a rest stop. And you, you know how it put, always puts you back on the main road. In the same way, the scenic route puts you back on the main highway, only it's more informative. And so our road, called the love of the Father, starts in John the third chapter, which is undeniably one of the most important in the entire gospel. Uh, John 3.16 is probably uh, a verse that most people know. And so, but these verses, uh, the third chapter of John, makes it clear that Christ and Christ alone is the means of salvation for the entire world. And it also states that those who reject Jesus are rejecting God. The chapter starts out 
by introducing us to a man called Nicodemus. And we're, we're told that he's a Pharisee and a member of the Jewish council, ruling council. And from that, we have surmised that he is a pious and knowledgeable teacher of religion and the law. That he's a Pharisee and a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. And the Jewish Sanhedrin is uh, it, it's a Jewish court that had 70 distinguished members. Nicodemus came from an important aristocratic family in Jerusalem, and he was an authority on scripture. We also said that no one really knows why he came to Jesus at, by night, but it's fun to speculate. And, and so some of the reasons may have been that he wanted to speak to Jesus in secret so as not to arouse suspicion or to invoke the criticism among his Sanhedrin colleagues. Or maybe he just wanted the privacy that night would afford him without having to compete with the daytime crowd. Or maybe he felt lacking in his knowledge and didn't want to be exposed in a crowd. Then it may have been something so simple as he just didn't want to wait until morning. Whatever the reason, giving credit where credit is due, he did come to Jesus. He wanted to know who Jesus was. The miracles showed that God was with him, but Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And so Nicodemus just wanted to know. So he went straight to the source. He didn't allow pride or status to keep him from coming. And for that, I applaud him because the important thing is that he came. And because he came, he was given information that he would have never gotten otherwise. First of all, we learned that the way, the only, first of all, he learned that the only way to enter or see the kingdom of heaven was to be born again. In verse five and six, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. To, confuse, to the confused Nicodemus, Jesus emphasized the importance of new birth and that it is absolutely necessary. Jesus gave the nature of the new birth as being spiritual, not physical. The flesh cannot bridge the gap between flesh and spirit. Flesh is only flesh, and that is all it will ever be. It has no power to be born again or to become spirit. Jesus was preparing Nicodemus to understand that it is the spirit, not the flesh, that experiences the change called the new birth. Our grandparents in times past used to describe new birth by saying, I looked at my hands and they looked new. I looked at my feet and they did too. They were looking through spiritual eyes, not the flesh. In the flesh, their hands and Feet look the same, but because of the Holy Spirit who was in them, it all looked new. The new birth causes all things to be brand new. The Living Bible version of 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says, When someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. So Nicodemus and us are to understand that new birth or regeneration is no small insignificant change. It's a radical change and it is one which we cannot work for ourselves. We can't decide that we will stop doing this or that and cause new birth to take place. 
we can enroll in the best of the best seminar school, seminary schools, and our performance can be top in the class, and it will not cause new birth to take place. It does not come from knowledge. We can know the whole Bible, if that were possible, and yet head knowledge does not bring about new birth. We cannot overcome our sin nature by self-effort. We cannot will our sin nature to go away. No matter the effort we put forth in the flesh, whether it be great or small, trying to overcome the pride and lusting of the flesh, we still remain prisoners of the law of sin because flesh will only give birth to flesh. But the spirit gives birth to spirit. It is the Christ in us that will do the overcoming of the flesh. The good news is that we are not left in a pit of despair. There is hope. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Nicodemus is talking to the one who gives us the victory. In my mind's eye, I can see the confused look on Nicodemus' face. He is like, huh? What are you talking about? Then once again, Jesus responds to his thoughts and makes the statement in verse 7. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Think about that for a moment. Remember what Jesus is talking about, which is new birth, and remember to whom he is talking. He is talking to a Pharisee about the fundamental requirements of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has chosen to explain the doctrine of regeneration or the new birth, to a Pharisee in what seems to be an unscheduled meeting one night in Jerusalem. He has chosen to convey to his church the importance of being born again by painstakingly explaining it to Nicodemus, a Pharisee. Think about that for a second. Or two. A three, a Pharisee had all the high notions of self-righteousness. He would, Nicodemus would have considered himself as a true descendant of Abraham, fleshly speaking. And he would have felt that this gave him a legal right to all the promises of God. And in the case of Nicodemus, being a ruler of the Jews, one of the Sanhedrins, and a master of Israel, he was probably among the highest order of that leading class of people who felt that way. So I say it again. Think about that. Jesus is speaking to one who is at the top of the chain of commands as far as the keeper of the law of Israel and telling him bluntly, boldly, and without apology that everybody, including him, must be born again to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Get that. That Jesus, who is the great lawgiver, whose will itself is a law, Jesus, who is the great mediator of the new covenant, and as mediator, he has full power to settle the terms of our reconciliation to God. Jesus, who is the great physician of our souls, he knows our case well. He has read our charts and he knows what is necessary for our cure. He hands out the prescription. You must be born again. 
the name written on the prescription can be to all whom it concerns. Not only the common people, but the rulers, the masters of Israel, from the White House to our house, from the scholars to the uneducated, from Wall Street to our street, we all must take the same medicine. You must be born again. When we consider the holiness of God and the great design of the redemption plan, and then consider the wickedness of our nature and the eternal happiness that is set before us, we should not think it strange that the one thing that is needed is that we must be born again. Well, my ones, that's all I have for now. Until next time, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And until next time, join us again as we continue our scenic route, looking at the visit that Nicodemus had with Jesus. Until then, take care. We love you. And please come back again. Goodbye.